Hello again. My name is Jeffrey Davis, and welcome back to Radio Entrepreneurs. And I uh, want to thank our team, Chris Gerald, Nathan Gobes. Uh, take a look at our YouTube. You're going to see a whole new format. They're doing a great job. Better everything. And uh, you got to do. You got to keep raising the bar if you're interviewing over 6,000 entrepreneurs, which is what we've done here at Radio Entrepreneurs. My guest host today, uh, holding on to him for dear life, Peter Myerson from the law firm of Cone, Rasnick, Myerson, and Plout. Great to be here, Jeff. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Say it. Forever. Good. Okay, you heard it on the air. At There's least our until co- next week. No. <laughs> <laughs> our next guest, Nur Killick, owner of Serenade Chocolatier. And if you haven't had a Serenade Chocolate, you haven't had chocolate. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I love your chocolate. I told you I gained two pounds Monday night when I snuck into my <laughs> wife's box of Serenade chocolate. Well, just, just to add to that, every, every week we buy a pound of chocolate. A pound? Yeah, we buy about a pound every and week. And eat it by yourself? <laughs> no, but Peter doesn't gain weight. He has one of those magical metabolisms. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting worse, but... My wife and I share, actually. <laughs> she doesn't eat as much as you of it. Yes, she does. Really? Dark well, chocolate. She has you, a, you get dark, dark chocolate. We get dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. What's your favorite, Peter? You know, it's hard to say. I really like the maple sugar, mm. and I really <clears> like the orange. Yes, and, orange and chocolate is my favorite yeah, combination. And, and, and I'm just going to give a little pitch for your store. <laughs> 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 What's really unique about your stuff is you can mm-hmm. identify what you're eating, as opposed to just getting a wrapped piece of chocolate. And it's, and it's a thick piece of chocolate with a little splash of taste in the middle. And it's, that really appeals to me, because I like the chocolate. We, we try to balance it out, so yeah. nothing is overpowering. Yeah, you do a so, great job. So uh, before you tell us about the store, mm-hmm. tell us <clears throat> about how you got into the chocolate-making business in general. Did it start with your childhood? Is there any traditions passed on? Is there a story here? So my childhood, uh, it started when I was about 12 years old, and I decided to go to baking school, and we were living in, in Germany. And um, announced that to my parents, who said, oh, that sounds like fun. You, could, you can do that after school sometime. But there I started making cakes, and um, I, every neighbor, every birthday, everybody got something homemade by me. And that's where it all started. And I just fell in love with working with sugar and chocolate and ingredients. But... I have a very traditional old school parents, and that was not a profession. So I went off and became a mechanical engineer. And um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can definitely yeah, see that relationship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the right way to become a chocolatier, and uh, worked for General Electric for a few years. It didn't last for very long. It was only about seven years, and then um, decided, no, this is really what I wanted to do: is to go back into to working with my hands and and making chocolate. So I jumped into it with a very short course on chocolate, and opened up the Brookline store. But after that, I met the most fabulous human being in the world. And, this is a great store. And he must have been your you. must have been a significant other. No, 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 no but, but, he, but he, this is truly a great story. But yeah, he, he, he uh, let's see, after my husband is probably the love of my life, he was uh, eight, 75 years old and I was only 30, so. <laughs> well, that, that shouldn't stop anybody I did. in today's world. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, this isn't about you. <laughs> <laughs> I did leave my husband for him. Um, he was a candy maker from Vienna for about 40 years in Brookline, but he had just retired. And I had problems with recipes and really trying to figure out what I was doing because I didn't know what I was doing. And I called him up and he came in and started working with me. And it was this instantaneous uh, love affair. And he worked with me till he couldn't work anymore, until he was 90. And he taught me everything I really know about life, about chocolate. He's a um, dog house survivor. He, uh, he was... Um, like many Germans who came here right after World War II. And his mother was a candy maker in Vienna. So he had a lot of beautiful stories to tell while we made chocolates together. He was in the Vienna Boys Choir. We, he would sing or whistle most of the time when we worked together. It was really magical. And he, he looked like he walked down. It's like down. something we'd see a movie on. Yes. We should write a, you should write a story I about know. him. 
And I have lots of endless stories about him. But it is. It's like one of those stories about those, you know, educated, you know, working, successful Vienna families that were Jewish because they were in that part of the world. Yes. And how he, you know, you know, how their life was turned around and then how he ended up with you. And then he ended his life si- sort of singing. And, know, uh, and after what he went through. Oh, and he was never bitter for one day. And he was Viennese to the core where um, you talk about stories. Saturday nights were waltzing. That's what they did. That's what teenagers did (laughs) back then. And um, he went back to Vienna every year because the music, the chocolate, the food was just in his core. That's that was being truly Austrian. It's interesting. It's an interesting way to get into the business. So, so I was very lucky that I had such a human being in my life, and that really taught me all about what I was doing and, and about life. Well, he did it the old fashioned Europe way. He was an artisan. Yes. He taught you artisanship. Very much so. Versus mass production. Right. Which, which sort of raises the question you know, the question I've always had is why don't you have more outlets? So we once had. One. I know you. I, <laughs> we I, we I did. Used to, I used to buy from downtown. South Station? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, Peter is a chocoholic. <laughs> well, there are a few I, I, of us who count I, I on them. I put chocolate out of my house on purpose when he's coming over because I know he's going to sort of like like a cow grazing. <laughs> he's just going to move over and no matter and, and he'll start and he'll move into it. It's yeah. it's a happy piece of food. People are happy buying it, eating yeah. it. Um, yeah, and we're happy making it. But so why not make more people happy? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, this is about entrepreneurship. So, you know, the stories that w- we like are why people don't expand as well as why do they expand. It's probably two things for me. W- one is um, controlling my quality and maybe controlling everything I do. But I really do feel... You are a mechanical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel things made in small quantities and small batches work out better and and i never invested in large equipment to That's become true inve- across the food industry if you look at any of the mass-produced pies and cakes they're just not the same no as the little artisan shops that are obsessed with what butter they're buying and you know how they're sifting their flour and how they're rolling it and it, it because because baking as my wife always says to me my wife's you know tr- has a degree in culinary art she always says to me cooking Anyone can do, but baking is a science. Very much so. Uh, you know. And I don't want to be worried about the last two pennies of did I use uh, butter that's too expensive or can I really afford to use passion fruit, which is one of my favorite items, which is insanely expensive it to use as an ingredient. It comes in a heart. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's a lot of right, right, very good. And a lot of you know your companies choppings. don't use normal vanilla anymore. They use artificial vanilla. It's just too expensive. It's I almost just, impossible to find real vanilla in ice cream nowadays. I know. I yeah. just can't do that. I can't bring myself to do it. So I'd rather make it in very small quantities and control what I'm doing. Is, is the process hard? Making chocolate? Let's go, Peter. I want to take chocolate class. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you before Peter got involved. Do you put on chocolate classes? Once or twice a year, I do. Our kitchen is very small. and um, we... No wives. <laughs> <laughs> no evidence. <laughs> it's okay. Judah's probably going to listen to the segment, so I'm in big trouble. But I was anyway. <laughs> You've always been. <laughs> I want a chocolate class. Sure. Uh, we we offer it a few times a year, and mm-hmm. it, we only can put about twelve people in the kitchen I at, know. at a time. One, two, three, four. I'll add my wife to that. That's All right, five. That's very generous. My son, <laughs> six. And you're going to exclude Judith? <laughs> Seven, Judith. <laughs> All right, we're good. I mean, we don't need, we don't need twelve. We just can't. Does go anybody in this room 12? not want to go to a chocolate class to learn how to make chocolate? <laughs> can't, this guy. All right. I mean, we're just cutting out the middleman for Chris. (laughs) (laughs) He's looking up diets as we're talking. (laughs) So do you eat chocolate every day? I do, but I only eat dark chocolate. And um, I do struggle a little bit with making milk chocolate because it's, to me, very sweet. And I'm trying to figure out how sweet does somebody who likes milk chocolate like it so um do you make chocolate you're not going to get an answer from me i know do you make chocolate for those who can't eat sugar unfortunately not but our dark chocolate is was it monkey fruit they're now experimenting with have you heard about that yes (laughs) 
You don't like monkey fruit? <laughs> I haven't tried it. No, but that's it. It's right. A, yeah, yes. it's supposed to be very but, expensive, but very high sweet. quality natural sweetener. It's you know, a and lot. no aftertaste because yeah. all this devious no, and everything people else. Love, have a people lot of who are aftertaste. using monkey fruit, they're just experimenting with it. So I try to stay up on that stuff. <laughs> I'll have to try it. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm sure you haven't heard of it, Peter. I have no idea no, what you're Pe- talking no. about. I know, <laughs> never, not Peter. You know, tell us where the stores are so we can tell every, so everybody, so everybody can There's know. only one. And but it's... you can buy it in other stores. No, 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 no. And my fear of selling it to other stores is, again, how long is it going to sit on the shelf? Or are they right. going to sell? Gourmet stores do have chocolates that sit on the shelf for too long. So occasionally... Can they, can they sit on the shelf for too long? I prefer Chocolate? that they don't, yeah. So uh, really? the, the only other place you can buy it is in the Coolidge Corner Theater because they sell it very quickly. Oh, I bought it there. Yep. Right. So the bars. I went to the Jewish Film Festival. The bars are there. Yeah. And occasionally um, a store will approach me to sell it, and I will sell them very small quantities weekly. So I, how long is our class going to be? So if we're going to do this as a... About two hours. A, a, a mage retreat. That's my consulting yes, and, group. We're going to do it as a mage retreat, and we're going to come to your class. And if you're worried about dieting, you have to take everything you make home. So just yeah, put that fine. into your calorie count we for the week. Coor- <laughs> we'll just have to coordinate a date for two hours. It's one night? One night, yep. At, okay. All right, let's do it in the fall when it's cooler because it'll yeah. be very hard to take it home otherwise. Peter, I know, is in. Right? <laughs> You're in. No, no question about it. Right, right. So tell us where the store is so other people can get there without the class. <clears throat> it's in Brookline Village. The address, it's right in the heart of the village, 5 Harvard Square. So it's not in Cambridge. It's in Brookline Village. It's right where my daughter works. Would, is she at Dana-Farber? Right, down, right down, up the street. Right up the street. Is she at Dana-Farber? No, she? she's at Henry Bears Park. Oh, and yep. I, <laughs> That's our little community. We have the children's bookstore, us, Henry Bears Park. Okay, we'll stick her in the class too if she, but she'll say no just because I asked her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's great having you on the show. Remind everybody we're speaking to Nur Killick of Serenade Chocolatier. Thanks to Peter Myerson who's sitting beside me. And Peter is the greatest lover of chocolates I personally know. <laughs> <laughs> and I have seen him have milk chocolate when there's no dark chocolate around. Well, you, you know, what's interesting, we haven't had a chance to talk about it. It's, it's everybody in the store, though, all the employees, enjoy being there. I mean, and it's so clear when you go in. It's a so, very small space, and yeah. we, we like yeah. being together, or yeah. else it's it would a, be very it's, difficult. It's a very nice. <laughs> we'll be there. Very nice store. Well, thanks for being on the show, and Peter, thanks for bringing her in. Yeah, well, thank pleasure. you. Remind everybody, this is Radio Entrepreneurs, and we're sweet on chocolate, and we'll be right back after this break. <laughs> 